So, um, welcome to this um, doctoral thesis defense by Niklas Blomqvist. Uh, my name is Jonas Örtegren. I work in the same physics group as Niklas. I will be the chairperson of today's session. And I will introduce to you the main characters and the procedure of today. The main person of today's session is Niklas Blomqvist. He's the respondent. He has done a research work on graphene production and energy storage and described his work in a thesis. And this thesis will be reviewed and Niklas will defend his work. The second main person of today is the opponent, Professor Patrick Johansson from Chalmers University of Technology. Patrick Johansson received his PhD in inorganic chemistry from Uppsala University. He did a postdoc at Northwestern University in the USA. And since then he has worked at Chalmers where he became a professor in 2012. Then we have the examination committee. The examination committee will decide whether the respondent passes or fails uh, today's examination. And the examination committee consists of Professor Thomas Vågberg from Umeå University. His field is nanophysics and materials. Um, we have Associate Professor Reza Jonesi from Uppsala University. His field is chemistry of batteries. And then we have Associate Professor Birgitta Engberg from Mid-Sweden University. Her research interests concern fiber materials and chemical engineering. Niklas' main supervisor has been Professor Håkan Olin. Håkan Olin is professor in materials physics here at Mid-Sweden University. Co-supervisors uh, co um, um, have also been Dr. Kristina Dahlström, Midsweden University, and Dr. Renving Shang, uh, Midsweden University. And then there are more people that have contributed in different ways, both from Midsweden University and companies to this work. So the procedure is as follows. First, um, the respondent will present his work. Uh, then we will take a short break, a five minute break. You will have the possibility to leave and come back then. Uh, then there is time, then there is the opposition where the opponent uh, examines the thesis and asks the respondent questions and the respondent will defend his work. Then there is time for the examination committee to ask questions and then the audience can ask questions. After the defense, um, the examination committee will gather in the S building and discuss um, the defense and decide upon a grade. The grade can be pass or fail. We will then uh, go to the S house and wait for the decision. The committee will come out and declare their decision. Uh, and then we will have Smörgåstårta. <laughs> um, so, now the respondent will give a presentation of his work. The thesis has the title, Large Scale Graphene Production for environmentally friendly and low cost energy storage. So please, Niklas, the stage is yours. Thank you. So let's start then. If we look at the global scale, this is a problem. We are consuming more than 1 billion liters of oil every day, only in cars. And this, of course, has a lot of negative effects, ranging from <coughs> local emissions and smog, as you can see in this image, to global warming and a possible energy crisis. And even if electric cars get more and more popular, only 0.2% of the cars today are electric. We want to transfer from that to this. Nice clean environment, zero local emissions and 100% electric cars. But at the same time, we want to transfer from 80% fossil fuels 
in the global power grid to 100% renewable energy. This is not easy. It has a lot of challenges. With 100% electric cars, there will be a high peak power demand for charging, leading to large power grid fluctuations and a possible power failure. In Sweden only, to charge all cars at the same time would require three times the amount of power we have installed today. So we have the energy needed to charge, but not the power. This gives us a need for a power buffer. With 100% renewable energy, we will have a large share of intermittent energy, such as wind and solar power. And this, these energy sources are dependent on the weather conditions, which also gives us power grid fluctuations and an additional need for power buffering. To store energy, we need some kind of storage device. And the battery is the most common storage device for electrical energy. We use it in everything from mobile phones to electric cars today. And a battery stores energy electrochemically, easily explained by chemical reactions. And this gives a high energy density, but a rather low power density and pulse efficiency. And that together with a lifetime of five to eight years, give a low cost efficiency for use as a power buffer in the grid. But batteries are still uh, I mean, a good choice for basically all other alternatives or all other applications. <laughs> uh, compared to battery storage, supercapacitor stores uh, energy electrostatically through electrostatic charge separation. This gives a much lower energy density, but the benefits are high power density and high pulse efficiency. And that together with a lifetime of 15 to 20 years gives a high cost efficiency when it comes to this power buffering. However, supercapacitors today are still too expensive for large scale use. And here we need environmentally friendly and low cost materials and simplified processes. Okay, so the supercapacitor is a rapid storage device, but how does it work? A supercapacitor consists of two current collectors with an electrode on each side. In the center, we have a separator and everything is soaked in electrolyte. These two images show, the first image here shows a discharge capacitor and this is a charge capacitor. When the supercapacitor is discharged, the ions are randomly distributed inside the cell. When we put on a voltage, the ion moves to the electrode of opposite charge and forming a charge separation between the electrode surface and the ions and the energy is stored in this charge separation. So no chemical reactions occur. This separation is also very quick, which gives a rapid charge and discharge. It is also fully reversible, which means that the supercapacitor has a good cyclability. You can charge and discharge it about a million times. <coughs> yes. The electrode material in a supercapacitor needs to have high surface area to have a high capacitance. And as you can see in this equation here, the energy stored in the supercapacitor is proportional to its capacitance times the voltage square. The capacitance itself is proportional to the surface area of the electrode divided by the charge separation distance. And this distance is really small, it's in nanometers. If we then have a solid electrode, like this, only the outer surface contributes to this capacitance. But if we have a porous electrode, we have more surface area, we can get more ions close to the surface, and we get a higher capacitance. So high surface area is the key to store energy in a supercapacitor. Another part of the supercapacitor is the electrolyte. There are several kinds of electrolytes, but the two most common are organic and aqueous. <laughs> organic electrolytes have a high operating voltage at about 2.7 volts. And this, of course, gives a massive boost to the energy storage since the energy storage proportional to the voltage square. But on the downside, they are expensive, flammable, and in some cases also toxic. Aqueous electrolytes have a lower operating voltage at 1.2 volts. But one of the benefits here is low cost, about 30 times lower cost than organic electrolytes. And in generally, aqueous electrolytes are also environmentally friendly. The separator in supercapacitor is used <coughs> to avoid short circuit between the electrodes. The separator needs to be a good electrical insulator, but also a good ion conductor to allow the ions to move freely inside the cell. And normal materials used for separators are polymer films and paper. 
the last important part in the supercapacitor is the current collector. And the current collector needs to high, have high electrical conductivity to allow the transfer of electrons from the electrode to the source or load. It also needs to be electrochemically stable inside the electrolyte. Graphene is a, in theory, it's a very good candidate as an electrode material. Graphene is defined as one atom layer of graphite and it has a really high specific surface area. The surface area is more than 2,600 square meters per gram. So graphene is very, very thin. As a comparison, you only need two grams of graphene to cover a whole football field. That's quite impressive. Graphene also have high conductivity, about 10 to the power of eight Siemens per meter which is higher than both copper and silver. But graphene comes in many different qualities. And real graphene, or the definition of graphene, is just one atom layer of graphite. But then we have few layer graphene, which is two to five layers. And we have multi-layer graphene, which is six to 10 layers. And we have graphite nanoplatelets, and that is several layers up to a thickness of about 100 nanometers. And we have defined here that nanographite or nanographites <coughs> is a mixture of all these qualities with a specific distribution. To make graphene, we can exfoliate graphite. And exfoliation is a top-down method. This means to peel off layers. So what we want to do here is we want to peel off the graphene layers from the graphite structure. So it looks like this. This can be done both in dry and wet state. And uh, sonication is the standard laboratory procedure to do this. But sonication is low scale, it's time consuming, and the energy efficiency is really low. Other approaches are ball milling, rotary dispersers, and several more. Rotary dispersers and yet milling are seen as a state of the art today when it comes to scale, with a production rate of about 10 grams per hour or less. Different approaches to exfoliation uses different exfoliation techniques, but shear force is preferred to gently peel off these graphene layers from the graphite structure. But unfortunately, both edge collision and random collision also occurs in these approaches, which can crack the flakes to smaller fragments. In this thesis, I present a, a new way to exfoliate graphite to multilayer graphene and graphite nanoplatelets. The aim for this work was to maximize this shear force, the shear rate, and try to avoid the edge collision. I also wanted to produce these nanographites in water in a large scale and to a low cost. Our initial tests what we, was with a commercial homeionizer, and you can see the shear zone of that here. This shear zone had a high shear, but also high edge collision. So the particles or the flakes was uh, very small, uh, but we only had a low amount of thin flakes. The material we got here had a good conductivity, but we wanted thinner flakes and we wanted a bigger surface area of the flakes. We then developed a cone slit shear zone, looks like this. Unfortunately, this shear zone gave rise to an extreme shear. So the flakes was just small fragments and the conductivity when we made electrodes was really low. We then decided to simplify the shear zone as much as possible to also to understand what's actually happening inside the shear zone. And then I designed, designed a <coughs> tube shear system based on laminar shear in tubes. When we have <coughs> laminar flow in tubes, when we have laminar flow in a tube, the fluid velocity in the center has a higher, is a higher than close to the tube wall. And this means that we have several fluid layers with different velocities inside the tube. And in between this layer, we get shear forces. When the flow gets more turbulent uh, here, uh, we get a more chaotic situation. We have big lateral mixing, we have high and low speed regions and big possibility of collision and cracking the flakes. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, tube shear system had a sim very simple design and adjustable shear rate. And to prove the concept of, of this shear zone, we, um, we made a one meter long stainless steel tube with a diameter of two millimeters. We mixed 100 liters of water with 2% graphite and 0.04% polyacrylic acid as a dispersant bit to avoid flotation and this foaming when, when we mixed it. The flow rate was about 5 liters per minute, which generated a shear rate of uh, 10 to the power of 5 reciprocal seconds. 
and this is about one order of magnitude higher than uh, the, the shear rate needed to exfoliate graphite to graphene with a rotary dispersion in organic solvent. The initial material used was this thermally expanded graphite. Scale bar here is 100 micrometers. And when we have passed this initial material through the shear zone five times, we can find a lot of this kind of flakes. Partly exfoliated flakes with thin regions and thick regions. The scale bar here is five micrometer. When we exfoliated the material further, five more passes. So we had 10 passes through the shear zone in total. It was very easy to find these kind of flakes that are very thin. The scale bar here is one micrometer. Uh, after these 10 passes, we also uh, used atomic force microscopy to measure the thickness of the flakes. And we found that the average thickness was between 10 and 20 nanometers, which is approximately 30 layers of graphene. So it's graphite nanoplateless in that case. This atomic force microscopy image uh, shows a flake with nine nanometer thickness. Uh, we were really happy about these results because this shows that we can actually exfoliate graphi graphite to nanoparticles. But we wanted to understand what was actually happening inside the system. I mean, did we have laminar or turbulent flow? And what was the actual exfoliation mechanism? Was it shear between the fluid layers or did we have shear between the, the flake and tube wall? And also did the geometry of the tube make any difference? For example, if we have a straight tube compared to a helical coil shaped tube. And also how much shear do we actually need to, to make this graphene? To understand this, we combined simulations with experimental tests. And to simulate, we um, uh, we simulated two different geometries, a straight tube and a helical coil tube. Both of these tubes had a length of one, millimeter, uh, one meter and a diameter of two millimeters. And <coughs> the upper images here shows the fluid velocity vectors in the simulation. And the two lower images shows the average velocity. From the upper images we can see that the fluid velocity vectors has more than one direction. And we have a lot of high and low speed regions. And this means that the flow is turbulent. We don't have laminar flow in the system. We can also see from this helical coil shaped tube here that we have a swirling effect. It looks like the flow is rotating when it travels in the tube. From the lower images we can see that the straight tube have a high speed region in the center. But at the helical coil shaped tube the high speed region is shifted outwards towards the tube wall. So we can see from this that we had a difference between these two geometries. And maybe that makes a difference on the particle also. But first, to, <coughs> to exfoliate graphite, we need to overcome the shear strength of the material. And an exact number of this is really hard to find. But studies show on, on defect-free single crystal graphite that the shear strength is about 0.14 gigapascals, which is really high. Normal graphite have naturally crystal defects. So uh, the shear, uh, shear strength of this material is somewhere between 0.25 and 2.5 megapascals. We then use the simulation data, the fluid velocities, to calculate the shear rate or shear stress in this system. And this was what we found. We saw that the shear stress from the helical coil shaped tube was higher than in the straight tube. We also saw that the turbulent wall shear stress was much, much higher than the laminar st uh, shear stress contribution, about three orders of magnitude. But the most interesting thing here was this. Only the local wall, wall shear stress in the system had a high enough shear stress to overcome this shear strength of graphite. And that means that the exfoliation occurs at the tube wall and not uh, in the fluid between these laminar shear layers. Uh, on the experimental part, we characterized the material to get a size and thickness dis distribution. The size distribution was carried out with a scanning electron microscope. And the three images here are just examples of how the flake looks like in that kind of microscope. We analyzed 2,648 flakes from these two geometries, and we saw that this, the size distribution was <coughs> ranged from 100 times 100 nanometers up to about 10 times 10 
micrometers, so also broad size range. In this histogram, you can see the number of flakes on the y-axis and flake size on the x-axis. And the flake size here is presented in flake area, square micrometers, since all the flakes have different shapes. Here we can see that there is a difference, even if it's quite small, we have a difference between the straight tube and the helical coil shaped tube. The straight tube here is called S1 and the helical coil shaped tube is called S2. For the straight tube, the distribution peak is here at 0.12 square micrometers. That corresponds to about 350 times 350 nanometer large flakes. The helical coil shaped tube had distribution peak at 0.06 square micrometers. And that is 250 times 250 nanometers. So we could see that the helical coil shaped tube generated smaller flakes than the straight one. The thickness distribution was carried out with a Raman spectroscopy, uh, with Raman spectroscope. And <coughs> this image shows uh, how the flake looks like in an optical microscope with 1000 times magnification. But the limits with this, uh, or the weakness with this, uh, these measurements is the limits in optical resolution and also it's limited to the, the laser spot size in the Raman system. And this means here that we could only look at flakes that were thicker than one square micrometer. In this diagram we have the flake thickness in nanometers on this y-axis and on the x-axis we have the flake area in square micrometers, exactly as here. And from these results, even if we couldn't look at the smallest particles here, uh, the results shows a trend where smaller flakes also tend to be thin. For example, we can see here, when the flakes are a few square micrometer large, they seem to be between 1 and 10 nanometer thick. But larger flakes that are around 100 square micrometers, they seem to be around 100 nanometer thick. So the smaller the flakes gets in this process, the thinner they also are. And if you compare these two to each other, we can see that most of our flakes is in this region here, around 0.1 square micrometer. And that's somewhere here. So probably our flakes are in the few nanometer thickness range, somewhere there. And that is uh, multilayer graphene. So to summarize uh, this exfoliation part, we, uh, we demonstrated a, <coughs> a process or a, uh, yeah, to make a large amount of multilayer graphene and graphite nanoplatelets. And this uh, process is large scale. It can produce 600 grams per hour of the exfoliated material. And that is 10 to 100 times higher production rate than we can find in the literature. This also allows us to make 600 liters of this nanographite suspension in one day. So the test tubes are a little bit bigger than usual in the lab. This process was also low cost, about 10 kilowatt hour of, ele of electricity per kilo exfoliated material. And um, this is 100 times more efficient than sonication. It's also very similar to uh, the energy needed to make pulp in the paper industry. The process was also environmentally friendly since we only used the graphite and water and no toxic chemicals or organic solvents. But to make electrodes out of this, we needed to have a binder. And my colleagues and I tested several binders, both environmentally friendly and low cost binders, but most of them gave low strengths or low conductivity. There was only one that was different, that was nanocellulose. We found that when we mixed nanographite with nanocellulose, we got a composite, it looks something like this. We have the flake-like structure here is the nanographite, that's the graphene, multilayer graphene and graphite nanoplatelets, and the spider web structure is the nanocellulose. And this bio-based binder gave us a robust electrode with enhanced mechanical strength, enhanced wet strength, high porosity and a maintained conductivity, electrical conductivity. And this was, of course, exactly what we wanted. In figure A here, you can see an electrode without any binder. It's very brittle and cracks apart as soon as you touch it. And in figure B, you see with the electrode with 10% nanocellulose, and it's also really flexible. So it's a big difference with or without the binder. <clears throat> now, 
it was time to demonstrate an aqueous supercapacitor made out of this low cost material. And we decided that uh, we will keep this environmentally friendly and only use low cost materials. The only problem with aqueous supercapacitors is the current collector. Aqueous electrolyte means salt water, which easily creates corrosion on the current collector. And this current collector corrosion leads to high interfacial resistance between the, <coughs> the current collector and the electrode, which eventually give high resistive losses when we charge and discharge supercapacitor. And commercial supercapacitor, they use aluminum foil as current collector because it's low cost and it has a high electrical, con electrical conductivity. Uh, <clears throat> aluminum foil works really good with organic solvents, but in salt water we get corrosion and we get pitting. So we also tested to use stainless steel foil as current collector, but we saw that an oxide layer was quickly grown on the surface of the foil and that gave us high resistance and high resistive losses. So we need to find some, some other type of, of material for the current collector. We then thought that since our electrodes are made out of exfoliated graphite, maybe graphite foil can be a good candidate as current collector. Graphite foil is usually used as uh, seals in high temperature applications, but the conductivity is good and this theoretical carbon-carbon interface between the electrode and the current collector uh, might give us a low interfacial resistance. Graphite foil is also relatively low cost. Even if it costs five times more than aluminum foil, it's still six times cheaper than stainless steel. And to test this, we use this graphite foil as a current collector. We use this nanographite nanocellulose composite as a highly conductive matrix with high porosity. We used low cost activated carbons to increase the surface area of the electrode even further. And the amount of activated carbon used in this test was between 50 and 90 percent. These materials were mixed together and we casted them in casting frames to make electrodes, as you can see here. When the electrodes were dry, we cut them to 20 times 20 centimeter big pieces. And to assemble as a big capacitor, we took two of these electrode coated foils with a separator in between. We soaked them in electrolyte and put them in a pouch for electrochemical testing. This is the result. We quickly saw that the graphite foil gave us the low interfacial, interfacial resistance that we wanted to have. In this diagram, <coughs> you can see here to the right, this is the electrical resistivity of the electrode, freestanding electrodes without any current collector. In the middle, we have the electrical resistivity of the electrode coated graphite foil. The different colors here corresponds to the amount of activated carbon we have in the electrode. With the black one is 50%, the blue one is 60%, green is 70, and red is 80% activated carbon. So as you can see here, the more activated carbon we put in, the higher the resistivity gets. But still, coated on the graphite foil, the resistivity is more than one order of magnitude lower than on, in the freestanding electrode. We could also see that the equivalent series resistance in the supercapacitor was low for all, for all these samples, about 0 0.1 ohm. And this should be compared to 7 ohms when we use stainless steel foil. We could also see that the cyclability or cycle stability was good for these supercapacitors. We, uh, we uh, cycled them many cycles and we couldn't see any degradation after 1,000 cycles. We have also done more tests with several thousand cycles and we don't see any, any big, at least, degradation. Um, here we could see that the more activated carbon we put into the system, the higher the, the specific capacitance gets because we get a higher surface area in the electrode. But we got around 50 farad per gram with this low-cost material. So this low-cost supercapacitors generated about 50% of the capacitance compared to commercial supercapacitors, but the material was 90% cheaper. And it also contained only environmentally friendly materials. But to make <coughs> low-cost supercapacitors and low-cost energy storage, we of course also need a low-cost process, manufacturing process. 
And the aim here was to try large scale coating of these nanographite nanocellulose electrodes to get a high production rate and a low production cost. But now the issue was low solids content in the material. At the 4% solids content, we get a suitable flow behavior for coating. And 4%, that means that we have 4% of the nanographite nanocellulose mixture and 96% water in the slurry that we want to coat. It's a lot of water. If we go up to 10%, the viscosity of this slurry uh, becomes close to whipped cream. At 15%, it's more like cold rice pudding. It's very hard. And if we reach 20% or higher, it's almost solid. It's like hard butter. And this is a common problem for nanomaterials with high aspect ratio. When we have a thickness that is much, much smaller than the length or the width of the particles. And we can also see here that uh, this material has a shear thinning behavior. And shear thinning means that if, if you stir this slurry, the viscosity goes down. But it immediately gets thick again when you stop stirring. And this combined is of course problematic when it comes to large scale coating. Because we also want to have thick electrodes, we want to put on a lot of material. Then we have a lot of water to take away. Initially we sold this with these uh, casting frames when we, we casted the electrodes. Because then we can just pour the slurry there and then wait for it to dry. But this is of course small scale and takes forever to dry these electrodes. So we decided to test large scale coating. So we prepared 600 liters of this, <laughs> this uh, slurry, this nanographite non nanocellulose slurry. And then we went to Igisund to test their pilot coater. And here we coated on a, a paper substrate with traditional blade coating. And this experiment resulted in six kilometer of electrode. But unfortunately, the, the thickness of the electrode was, was too thin here. Uh, in this technique, the, <coughs> the electrode material, the, sl the slurry is drawn to the paper substrate with an applicator roll. And since the material is shear thinning, mostly water is transferred in this process. So to fix that, we need to dilute this uh, slurry very much to about 1%. And then even if we coated three layers, the electrode was too thin for supercapacitor use. We then decided to test slot die coating instead. In slot die coating, you have a pressurized bucket with the slurry. So you force the slurry through a small slit in the applicator and then immediately onto the substrate. So with this technique, we can use the shear thinning behavior to increase the solids content of the material. With this technique, it was possible also to apply a 300 micrometer thick wet layer of material onto the substrate. So, and that corresponds to about 10 grams of dried material for each layer we put on per square meter of, of substrate. Uh, and with this technique, we coated both one and two layers onto uh, graphite foil and onto the paper separator. And <clears throat> what we could see here that was that if you coated more than one layer, the specific capacitance was became lower. The highest specific capacitance we got when we had just coated in one layer. We could also see that the coatings on graphite foil generated a higher specific capacitance than coating on the paper substrate. And the interesting thing here is this. We achieved 74 alpha gram, which is about 70% compared to commercial supercapacitors. But this was much, much higher than the earlier test where we also have activated carbon. Here we just have the non-graphite non-cellulose mixture. This material is really low cost. We could also see that the equivalent series resistance was quite low for all samples. It was one ohm or lower, which is good considering we didn't have any calendaring of the electrodes or we didn't have any compression on these capacitors. And we could also see that it was a quite small difference between the paper separator coatings and the graphite foil coatings when it comes to resistance. And that is a good thing because. <coughs> In theory, at least, it, uh, hey, with the paper substrate, it's possible to get a higher coating speed and a higher production rate than to coat on a smooth graphite foil, because that's really hard to do. Okay, so <clears throat> to conclude these results, we, uh, we have demonstrated a full adjustable insulation process. 
for large scale production of multilayer theme and graphite non platelets. This process has a low energy cons consumption and we use no toxic chemicals or organic solvents. You can also see that monocellulose is a good alternative as a binder for this exfoliated material. It generated enhanced mechanical and electrical properties. Furthermore, we saw that its slot type slot die coating enables coating of thick electrodes, both on the current collector and onto a paper substrate. And slot die coating also allows us to have a quite low solid content since the coating, wet coating thickness is very large. And we think that this might be a large a route for large scale production of these kind of electrodes. We also demonstrated a low cost and metal free so we have the concept based on this material. We only used low cost materials and the ingredients was carbon, cellulose, paper, and salt water, which are completely environmentally friendly. And these supercapacitors uh, achieve 70% specific capacitance compared to commercial capacitors, but to a 90% material cost reduction. So the cost efficiency of these supercapacitors is actually really high. <coughs> So uh, I hope that the results of my thesis can, can contribute to this transition that I showed you in the beginning. Thank you for your time. <laughs>